Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before, this is Gap, the Great American Broadcast Network. Is the part where I sing. I can't tell you how embarrassing that is to do when there's somebody in the room who's never seen you do that before. Uh, girlfriend isn't going to be here tonight because she's uh, she's uh, she's a lazy fuck. Uh, no, she does. She. It, we, we have a guest staying with us, so she said, why don't you have the guest on, uh, uh, as, as a guest on the show? And I said, well, fine. You know, the world is expecting you, but uh, instead uh, they can get, uh, well, we're trying to figure out what to call you, actually. You, you go by two names. Use my new name. Your new name? Turn just a little bit this way, then they can kind of see you, and yeah, then when you talk to me, it, it works okay. Uh, uh, use the new name? Yes. See, I've known him for years by another name, and so has the industry, the broadcast industry. And so has MasterCard. And so has MasterCard, and probably still does. Best to use a new name. But he uses the name Walter Sterling as a professional name, uh, which he uses to um, um, uh, do a program. On How many stations are you on now? 58 stations. 58 stations across the country. And Guam. At <laughs> I'm live in Guam. At, you're live in Guam. 3 p.m. on Mondays because of the time zone. I'm live in Guam. Okay, now you're, you're on at a weird time. Yes. You're on, you tell them what, when you're on. 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern time. Yeah. 7 to 10 p.m. Pacific time. Yeah. In every city, whether it's on the East Coast, Midwest, or Guam, it's live. Now that's very unusual in network radio. Usually in network radio, you'll be on at, at random, you'll be on at a certain time, but different stations air it at different times. But I'm on live. Why, why is that? Which part? That was the being live all the time, uh, everywhere. It makes it very easy to get phone calls. Yeah. And I can't make any mistakes in terms of something happened in the news that we missed. If it yeah. happens in the news, we'll have it on the air. Yeah, but do you don't deal with news topics that much, do you? I deal with the things that He does a different kind of talk show. Yeah. However, if there is breaking news, I do share it. So when the NBA Finals are over during my show, or the Oscars are over during my show, or the Emmys, I do reveal that those, yeah. the, the results of those events. Okay, so now, let me, let, me, let me say this. that Before he did this radio thing, which is pretty recent, actually, all right. Uh, he, for years, has been one of the major broadcast consultants in this country, a job that no longer exists. <laughs> okay, I mean, cons every, it, years ago, every station had a consultant. Yes. Some this was somebody they explained consultancy. It's somebody who borrows your watch to tell you the time. Yeah. <laughs> a consultant is somebody. For years, in a given city, yeah. there'd be 40 or 50 stations, and they were owned by 20 or 30 different companies. Okay. Therefore, there was vast competition. You needed all the help you could get. Right. Companies would hire advisors to a radio station who were experts in different formats, talk, top 40, adult yeah. contemporary, classical music consultants, that helped them make sure that they could beat their competitor. About 20 years ago, the industry was consolidated just like Avis and Budget are now owned by the same company. Hertz and Dollar are owned by the yeah, same now company. Now all the companies are just owned by Beavis and Butthead. And where there used to be 20 owners, now in most cities there are exactly four, which means that all the radio stations you used to compete with are now down the hall. Yeah. And you have to get along with all of them. I found that the most disconcerting thing when it first happened, and I went to work uh, 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 boss of mine was working for what was then it was before it was iHeart Radio it was uh, uh, Clear Channel and uh, he said would you come and do do a show in the morning for the time being while we decide what we're going to do with the mornings and uh, ultimately they took a show from out of town that wasn't costing them anything but anyway uh, I worked 
there and it was the Clear Channel cluster. And so my competition, who was Jim Lang, was working in the studio next to me. And I found that very disconcerting because I was brought up in this in this almost uh, killer instinct radio where you hated the guy across town, you were out to kill him, you were out to make him lose, and now you're meeting with him in the hallway during during the, the news break uh, saying, how you doing today, Jim? What's what's happening? Fine. The competition used to be so fierce yeah. that it was not unheard of that if there was a station in your format across town owned by another company, it was not unheard of to at 3 in the morning for the tower of your competitor to mysteriously fall. The guy wires on the tower were mysteriously cut. It was not unusual for your fax machine to be jammed with complaint letter after complaint letter after, after uh, uh, complaint uh, uh, letter from yeah, advertisers yeah. and listeners demanding that you stop well, doing whatever you're well, doing. Well, we never went that far. Darn. But you always learned to hate your competitor because yes. they were your dreaded enemy. Because there, there. It wasn't like you were working in a cluster and you all worked for the same guy. You were each individual station. The sales departments were out on the street trying to beat the brains out of the right. sales departments from the other uh, other stations. And all of a sudden, consolidation happened. As you say, five guys own all the stations in one town. But I'd and two of them are bankrupt. Well, let's talk about that part. Yeah. I would suggest that consolidation is less of an issue than another law which is never discussed. There used to be a law that said, if you wanted to own a federally licensed property. Here we go, I know this one. Get you going. had to have enough, enough solvency to pay the bills for three years. You could not deficit finance a radio station. You had to have enough money in the bank and prove it to the FCC that you could operate that station for three years and the license was only good for three years. Every three years they would make sure you were solvent, that you could pay your bills. That went away with consolidation. Suddenly, you could deficit finance a radio station, mm. and therefore Wall Street and venture capitalists, who are all evil, found an attractive investment because not only could they deficit finance it, but there was no longer a law about how long you had to own it. It used to be you had to own it for three years, yeah. or you had to own it for seven yeah. years. Now you can buy and sell them like baseball cards. Yeah, and, and, uh, and pretty well do that on, uh, on uh, a dime. You yes. know, on, on some financing you got somewhere. Uh, but, no, I remember that, that you had to prove. I mean, in a way, there was something wrong about that from this, only this standpoint, that I remember a bunch of kids I knew who went to the FCC and said, we want to buy a we want to put on a radio station on the air. And they said, well, here's what you got to do, and here's what you got to do, and here's what you got to do. And, and then they walked out going, we can't do any of that. You know, we don't have three years worth of money to keep a radio station going. We just want, we love radio. We want to start a radio station. So they said, fuck you. And they went out and started doing pirate radio stations in Westchester. And they became quite notorious, as a matter of fact. I have a contrarian point of view about pirate radio. Yeah. I was consulting a radio station in Dublin, Ireland. Yeah. And... I'm looking at the rating books and I said, well, what about this station or this station? In the rating books, they said, well, those are pirate stations. I said, what? He said, those are pirate stations. I said, that's terrible. What's your industry doing to get rid of them? Oh, nothing. They're part of our culture. And in Ireland, pirate radio stations are, are used differently. They're part of their culture, but they're often used to promote a nightclub or a concert or a business for two or three months at a time. And it's a radio station that will go on and focus on a particular artist or lifestyle or culture for two or three or four months at a time. But they view it as part of their culture. My point of view is they're fine. I think pirates radio stations are great. I don't have any problems with right. pirate radio right. stations. But what I'm saying is yes. they started pirate radio station and because they just said, well, if they won't give us a license and we'll just go on the air. We know how to build a transmitter. Yes. And they built a pretty low low frequency, low wattage transmitter, and of course the FCC came along and yeah. busted them. They have no sense of humor. Uh, and then one of these guys came to me, I didn't know at the time that he was a pirate, when I was working at ABC I was looking for a pro uh, producer. Uh, so uh, this guy came to me and uh, he said, I'd like to be your producer, and I said, oh, okay, fine. He was technically blind and all of that, and I just figured let's help him out, okay? Because uh, all the producer did for me was answer the phones and puts people on hold, right? Right. Uh, and uh, so he, he made a living off of working at ABC being my producer. 
in his spare time he was a pirate broadcaster and when I found that out I went this is terrific yes. ABC is paying for a guy to run a pirate radio station and I was so happy with that and uh, years later they had a boat they got out on the out here or something they were running a pirate uh, operation off a boat and he was the guy who was the head of that that was a big deal where is he now money. he's dead <laughs> Was he, was he, he shot he, by broadcasters? Well, he became he became a tr uh, transsexual, uh, and then he died. So, yeah. And he didn't talk to me. He got mad at me. He didn't talk to me uh, ever again because I one time said it referred to him as, as he because I always knew him as a he. Whenever I worked with him, he was a he. And you can't suddenly call somebody a she when you can't even see them in front of you. you it's, know? A, it's a pretty good Pride Month story. Y yes, it is. And I didn't mean to upset him, you know. I want I you. respect people. Actually, you would be the last one to, to mean to upset him. Yes, right. You would have respected right. him more than anybody, and I know that for a fact. Yeah. So, so here you find yourself. Now you were a consultant. And yes. You would go in. You tell people, uh, "Here's how you should do things, and uh, these are the formatics you should use, and here are some good ideas." And then you get a, you gave great lectures on how to do things to the crew and everything. And you're really good. Thank I mean, you really were. You were the, and he's the guy that got me into Sirius XM. Best thing I did. Yeah. Uh, and what was the worst thing they ever did? They got rid of me. Anyway. Uh, and they killed Lynn Samuels. And they killed Lynn Samuels, exactly. But he he is the guy that, that uh, walked me around the floor and told everybody, you got to hire this guy, you got to hire this guy. And uh, he's responsible for me having gone to, uh, to Sirius because he was the consultant at Sirius. Uh, but that wasn't a solitary decision. Many people there were very happy to see you and wanted to hire you because you're well known or notorious, depending on your point of view. Yeah. Even there was there were at least a hundred different talent working there at any given time. Alex Bennett was the only talent that Howard Stern walked in on, recognized, acknowledged, and frequently shared respect on his show. You. Yeah. Well, I never heard it. But. Yeah. He walked in on your show. Well, why he did my well, show, but that's because he was supposedly mad at me. That would be a show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was one of the few shows he ever went and visited. The only one. No, there was one other. He went to somebody else. I can't remember. Martha who. Stewart? Nah, it was somebody else. It was, um, oh, God, I'm trying to remember. It was an actor who died. Uh, and, uh, oh, God, I I'm trying to remember his name. Anyway, yeah. uh, but he had a show, and I, I think Howard went in to see him because he knew he was dying, okay? Uh, but uh, uh, but he got me my job there, and you used to give these lectures to everybody about here's what you do, here's what you don't do, and they were very good. Thank you. You know, they were very good. They were very inspiring. I mean, normally with consultants, I'll listen to what they had to say, go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh -huh. and then go back in and do what I do. Uh, because after all, I am I know more than anybody. Of course you do. You know, I think the reason I was able to have that effect on a, on you and other great talent was because I never got confused about my role. Yeah. And my role was not to tell you how to be a talent or what to talk about. Yeah. It was just to share stagecraft with you, so you got maximum credit for what you were doing. Yeah. That was my whole goal. Was how do I yeah. get? How do I help them get maximum credit? either listeners, subscribers, Nielsen ratings, whatever it needed to be done so that their their magic, their stardom, their their skill yeah. would be properly showed. Now, prior to being a consultant, you were also the head of... I was of, a suit. You were a suit. I was a Brooks Brothers suit. Yeah. And I'd like to point out about the Brooks Brothers suits. The reason why I've always worn Brooks Brothers... Do they still have Brooks Brothers suits? Do they what? Do they still have Brooks Brothers yes, suits? Yes, very popular. Okay. The, the reason I have always worn Brooks Brothers suits is I have a body made for Brooks Brothers. Yeah. That's it. Every now and then I've tried to wear different suits like fancier Paul Stewart suits. Disaster. Always a disaster. Yeah. Those are yeah. made for Italian yeah. guys who have 30 inch waists and three wives. Mine is a Brooks Brothers body and I will prove it to you. Twice, not once, but twice, I have walked down Fifth Avenue in my suit twice. Complete strangers have come up to me and said, sir, where is Brooks Brothers? For some reason, they decided on site that I would know where Brooks Brothers was, and, and I did. And of course you did. Yeah. Now, I was a suit. I was head of the ABC radio networks. 
the vice president general manager of the ABC radio networks, which at the time was the largest radio company in the world. Before that, I got really lucky. And Fred Silverman was the new chief executive officer of NBC. Yeah. And I had a hunch that he wouldn't like anything he saw at NBC Radio because he had been the hotshot programmer at ABC. Right. And the television network was thriving under his leadership. Right. And at the same time... In case time, people don't know, Fred Silverman was pretty much it when it came to the broadcasting industry. He was the golden boy. The only man to ever program ABC, NBC, and CBS. He programmed all three networks. Wow. And couldn't hold a job, huh? No, couldn't <laughs> hold a job. And he's still alive and, and doing yeah. great, and he's a dear friend. Yeah. But he, I knew enough about him and ABC Radio that once he saw NBC Radio and how it was run, and frankly who was running it, he would have no patience with it. I found out what day NBC Radio was going to present their business plans to him. Mm -hmm. And I called his office and said, hi, I, I'm, I work at ABC Radio. This is what I do. I'd like to meet with you about your radio division. Yeah. He grabbed the phone and said, come over now. And I went over to his office, and in his office was, this, was him, president of broadcasting, head of labor relations, head of personnel, chief financial officer for freaking NBC. Yeah. All these people were in his office at 30 Rockefeller Plaza overlooking the ring. And me, I was there. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And I was 26. Yeah. And I made a pitch to be president of NBC Radio. Made the pitch. It took two hours. I sweated for two freaking hours. These guys asked me questions. In a Brooks Brothers suit. Thank God. Yeah. It hit all the problems. Right. Next morning at 8 a.m. at home, I get a call from the head of labor relations saying we'd like to offer you to be executive vice president in charge of the FM stations. Just the FM stations. Okay. Then Fred gets on the phone and says, listen, fix these stations and then we'll take care of you. Okay. The stations had lost money for 40 years. Well, those FM stations were, as a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, now correct me if I'm wrong, the FM stations, it, when you bought a radio and it had both AM and FM on it, they had the AM dial at the top and the FM dial at the bottom, and then a little switch you would flip to go from AM to FM. That And all the ABC stations, they were on the exact point where you would have put the dial for the AM. Am I right about that? Yes, but NBC wasn't that strategic. You're right about that. The yeah. ABC did work like that. The history of the NBC FM stations was amazing because Major Armstrong, who invented FM yeah. in the RCA labs, invented it for RCA, got into a fight with David Sarnoff, mm -hmm. the chairman of, of NBC. Yeah. Big fight. And that was in 1948. From the moment they had a fight until the moment I was hired, NBC did not put one dime into those stations, not one penny. I was 26. All of the transmitters were older than I was. Rain was coming into the San Francisco radio station FM transmitter. Yeah. Um, they were all on used automation equipment that they had bought from God knows where, from Russia. Yeah, but they didn't care about FM, basically. They didn't Any think of these it was, guys. They didn't think it was radio. ABC was further along, but NBC didn't even think it was radio. Wow. So, but they, but they had these channels because they figured, eh, they better have them just as a... Well, they invented it. Yeah. That was the thing. They were the first allocations in every city. The NBC yeah. stations were the, had the best frequency and the best allocations, and then they did nothing. And in case, in case people don't know, I mean, if you've ever listened to AM and you listen to FM, you notice there's a difference in quality. And it, 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 we could explain it. There's a thing called a carrier frequency, a carrier. And on the carrier goes the signal, okay? Now, that's an AM, but an FM... You have two carriers, one at the top, one at the bottom, and the signal goes between them, and that's why the sound is so clean. You never hear static, you know, nothing. And nobody knew what to do with it, and yet finally one day somebody did. They played some music, and they heard how good it sounded. And, but, it, but it really didn't take off until progressive music came along. It until was free-form progressive music and a change in the law. What law? That you could no longer simulcast your AM and FM. You had to program the FM separately. It was about 1966, mm -hmm. where it said, okay, you can't do these simulcasts Oh, anymore. okay, so they had to start doing their own program. However, they weren't going to spend any money on it. None of those companies did. So they said to people like you and me, listen, you kids, go do whatever you want with those FMs. 
go do whatever. We're going to go back and play golf now, and we're going to go to the bar. You yeah. do whatever you want. Just don't say any four-letter words. Yeah, and uh, keep, don't lose the don't license. Don't tell anybody anything. What was interesting to me about the history and the reason why FM became successful was that the people who gravitated toward it were the scary kids, but they were also, think about it, at that time, late 60s, they were the most powerful and successful top 40 disc jockeys. B. Mitchell Reed, Tom Donahue, Scott Muni, right. Murray the K was the first program director of ORFM. They all were earning the most money they could. They were at the top of their craft, top of their skills, top of their earning. They walked away from those jobs to start FM radio stations that didn't pay as much but allowed them to do whatever they wanted to do. And more interesting, they were all over 40. Wow. Wow. Well, the thing is that uh, when I went to work for ABC FM, uh, every station had exactly the same shows. Yes. Uh, they had come up with a system whereby, for instance, Dave Herman was in, San, in New York. He would do his show live. Then when he was through, he'd go into a studio and he would voice track a show for three or four hours. It was going to go on for three or four hours. And then they had these machines that played the music. Uh, it was, uh, it, you went in there and it was like you were looking at the future. You know, all these things were automatically going off and, right. and so on. And what they had in every city, they had a guy doing a live show, and that guy would do the tapes for the other stations so that your full day had a complement of the best disc jockeys they could lay their hands on across the country. When I came into it is when they decided to do away with that and started to do real programming. And so there was me and what Dave you Herman did and Michael on the Kuskuna. on the talk show overnight on WPLJ in New York was revolutionary. It was remarkable. What radio. I stayed awake. You stayed awake. <laughs> More importantly, two or three listeners in Jersey stayed awake, yeah. which I think is impressive. Yeah, yeah. But what you did had never been done before. There had never been talk targeted for people under fifty. Well, I started that at WMCA. Right. Never been done before. And then I got fired by WMCA, and I went over and did By the it. way, trivia question, who was the one smart enough to have hired you at WMCA? Who was the person smart enough? That it was a, actually, it was a consultant who found me, and I'm trying to remember his name now. Uh, you're going to refresh my memory, aren't I you? I don't know. Oh. I always wondered who was that smart, and then who was brave who enough to let the, it. Who were some of the big consultants of the time? If I don't you name know. Them, if you name them, I'll know. I don't know. Yeah, it was a consultant. It was before me. He found me in Chicago. It's strange how I got my job at WMCA. I had a job in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I was doing a talk show, and then we had a meeting one day, and I had done something on my talk show the night before, which I called the Intergalactic Telephonic Talent Show. And people would call up and start playing instruments on the, on the air, yeah. and singing, uh, or telling jokes, or whatever. And I felt, you know, this is kind of revolutionary because this isn't traditional talk. This is a way of taking talk and, and, and expanding it, putting it in other areas, what we would call non-traditional talk. And so there was a staff meeting the next day, and the guy who owned the radio station said to me, and Alex, never do that talent show again. And I said, you didn't like that? He said, it's the worst thing I ever heard in my life. I said, well, then you can take this job and shove it. And I got up and I walked out. As I'm walking out, talk about fate. The uh, uh, receptionist says, uh, here, you have a message. And I took the message. I wadded it up and put it in my pocket. And I went home. And I was really depressed. Of course, I, what or have I done? I just quit done? my job. And I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Which is depressing know. enough. This is depressing enough. And uh, uh, I... I, I as I'm looking out the window and it's snowing outside, I'm talking to my wife, Ronnie, and saying, I really blew it this time. And I reached in my pocket and I opened it up the piece of paper and says, call Bill Moomy at WIND in Chicago. So I called him in Chicago and they said, are you available? We'd like to hire you. <laughs> you know, I mean, talk about fate. Right. I mean, you know, but that's not what blends into the New York story. What happened with the New York story was this, this consultant calls me up and says, we'd like to talk to you about going to work at WMCA in New York. And when I went to WIND in Chicago, I wasn't doing a, a talk show, I was doing a music show. In fact, my newsman was uh, the guy from Soul Train, uh, um, 
Don Cornelius. Don Cornelius was my newsman. Wow. And we used to have musicians. Did you know about that story in no. Chicago? Oh, oh, the Musician Union, yes. Musician I know Union about said that, that anybody story. that played music yes. had to be a musician. So I had a guy with two turntables in the room with me who would yeah. play all the music. Yeah. But anyway, uh, he says, uh, we'd, I'd like you to come to New York and talk to us about going to work at uh, WMCA uh, in New York. Uh, uh, this is just pure luck. And I said, how did you find out about me? And he said, Oh, the guy who owns the station in Minneapolis said you were terrific. Huh. For some reason, in spite of everything, this guy in Minneapolis liked what I did, basically. So uh, I got the job at WMCA in New York. And I'm well, your GabNet crew may not know yeah. how revolutionary and terrifying what you did on M WMCA was. Because it's one thing to do out-of-the-box progressive conversation and anger and rage. It's one thing to do that. It's quite another thing to be that subversive on a mainstream New York City commercial radio station owned by a family. At any point did they say to you, cool it? They never, now that I think about it, you're right, they never told me to cool it. They just one day fired me because they had the Yankees coming in. But no, I never, I never really got told don't do that or do this. Uh, and they pretty much, I think they bought the product, you know. But uh, 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 they were, uh, the family, unfortunately, the Strauss family, uh, were not the best people. Has yeah. anybody ever pointed out that uh, our Peter Strauss is Monica Lewinsky's oh, yeah. I, stepfather? I, I, I was talking, about, talked that about, about, that. I was talking about that No the one other else day. has ever talked about that. It's yeah. amazing yeah. to me that our you Peter, are it. Our Peter Strauss was my uh, the guy who owned the radio station, and his wife was uh, Mrs. Salzberger. Yes. She was one of the New York Times uh, uh, breed. Uh, and uh, they were, in some ways, they were horrible. I mean, they were they were very elitist and all of that. You know, she used to refer to the people who worked at the radio station as the little people. You know, and she would invite the little people on Christmas to come in and have a drink in their office, and it was the most pathetic Christmas party I've ever seen in my life. So they went and held their own at a bar, and that was a, even a more pathetic Christmas sure. party. It was like we were working for Scrooge. Yeah. You know, uh, but. Uh, uh, that job, uh, uh, you know, uh, then, I, then I got fired from that because they hired the Yankees, got the Yankees, and they said, we won't need you for half the year practically because of the games. And uh, rather than keep me on and put me somewhere else or whatever, uh, they dumped me. And I got fired, and the New York Times put a big article in there, and I had about four articles on one page of, of Variety. It was a big deal, and there were people demonstrating outside the radio station. So a guy named Alan Shaw over at ABC said, I like all this publicity you're getting. Why don't you come over and work for us? And that's how I went over there. Alan WPS Shaw is head of the ABC-owned FM station. Yes, right. He is one of my heroes and a dear friend. Yes, I know. He's, uh, he was very courageous in doing what he did on every level, putting you on yeah. the air, putting on album rock, convincing the company to stick with it until he could figure out how to make money with it. And ultimately, the reason why album rock sustained and grew and is still a format yeah. is because he figured out how to make money with it. Yeah. Uh, and and but uh, he uh, didn't I meet him at one of your parties? Yes. Yes, I met up with him after years and years and years, and I'd wondered what had happened to Alan Shaw. He's know. now the vice chairman of Beasley. Yeah. He owns Centennial Broadcasting. He owns three or four radio stations, and he married the heiress to the Winston Salem and the Krispy Kreme fortune. Really? He is. Uh, Do you have his number? Uh, <laughs> you need to call him immediately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so he's still he's still working in the business, God. He's still working, and he's still uh, a he's progressive. He's got to be thing. my age. Um, well, he's a lot older than you, Alex. He, he is. Oh, a lot older. And and yet he's still working, running Beasley and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good for good for Alan. I and he, and he still thinks the same. He still thinks new, different. Yeah. Fresh ideas, innovation. He's that guy. There's there isn't a thing that's old about him except the toupee. Uh, well, I, I I always liked Alan. You know, he was a, he was a decent sort. And the result was that all those radio stations that were owned by ABC were happy places to work. Those were good places to work, and that was him. As as time went on, less so. Is that right? Yeah. 
Who bothered you there? Uh, the, they hired a program director. I'm trying to remember his name now. He's quite well known for having been a program director. And he and Bob I. Bob Hanneberg? You no. Know, uh, Larry Berger? Larry Berger. I didn't know Larry was there when you were still there. Yeah, no, I'm the re one. You know, I, I couldn't. Uh, he and I never got along. Never got along. Most of the hosts, ha most of the disc jockeys there had a lot of trouble with Larry. Yeah. Because he over he micromanaged, he was obsessed with minutia. The yeah. trade off was the station sounded spectacular. That was always the trade off. It's like Larry's such a pain in the butt, but the ratings keep going up and, and the station sounded spectacular. Yeah. Well, I mean he he, he formatted it more and right. you know, it it became uh, it it when I first went there it was so progressive that, you know, Basically, you could bring in your record collection from home and play it, okay? Uh, and by the time when he got there, it all kind of changed. There were playlists right. and things like that. Of course, I was still doing talk, and I was doing talk from 2 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the morning, yeah. which was the best time to do a radio the show. The best time you to know do a radio why? show. Not only was it just you, me, and the microphone and the audience out there, you know, those people out in the dark like right. Gloria Swanson used to say uh, but also they they didn't know I still had a show there I mean it was like out of mind out of sight once a year I would go in for the big meeting that they would have with everybody and, and I, I sat there and uh, uh, as I went in I would talk to the past the reception and she says and who are you no yeah they, because I never saw me I was that thing that was in the middle of the night but you made a very important point, which is my show's on late at night. It starts at 10 p.m., goes to 1 a.m. Yeah. If given a choice, yeah. and I could do the show five days a week, and they said, but it has to be midnight to five, I would say thank you. Because I can't think of a better time to do a radio show than overnight. But they don't have overnights anymore. Very few do. And yeah. it's because of a profound lack of understanding of what you just said. No product is going to oh. sell better and faster than to an overnight audience. There may be fewer of them, but you're going to move more product at 3 in the morning than you will at 3 in the you, afternoon. I've got to in New York City, the overnight audience, you talk, people listen to me and they say, oh, 2 to 6 in the morning, who was listening? It's huge. I had a larger audience from 2 to 6 in the morning than I ever had from 6 to 10 in the mornings in San Francisco. And I had a lot of people. In, I, had, you know, I had great right. ratings in San Francisco. But just that small nighttime audience in New York was larger. It was amazing. Well, it's a three-shift city. The, you know, you'd have it in... Is it today, or yes. is it kind of changed? No, it's, yeah, I think it's more so. I think because of all of the Silicon Valley industry that's in lower Manhattan, I think it's more so. You no, know, there aren't factory workers here, but yeah. there, are, there are Silicon Valley workers, and every investment banker is up at 2 in the morning uh, sweating out their guilt. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this, uh, kind of bring this slowly to an end, because I could go on for two hours with you. Um, uh, the business today. Now, obviously, there there really isn't room for consultants anymore. Am I no, right about that? there's very little need. Is there anybody working the consultants? Yes, there are consultants work, but they do different things. They do uh, profound and detailed ratings research. They do a, the, Because today our ratings are done by meters yeah. rather than diaries, yeah. there's a lot more granular data that they like to talk about. They're researchers that can match your topics to the ratings on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. That's valuable and interesting, but of no interest to me. Yeah. It is typical in every industry to whine about the state of your industry today. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest to you that when you and I were doing Top 40 in the 60s, the people who used to write scripts for mystery theaters and dramas and soaps on radio in the 1940s were miserable. Yeah. The people who wrote scripts in Folly Men from the 40s once you got to the 50s and 60s and all those sound effects were pre-recorded, those guys were miserable. Things evolve. There are going to be people who are left out, people who can learn new things and adapt, and they'll do fine. The, I would suggest that at any point in the history of radio or any form of show business, somebody's miserable because yeah. something stopped. Yeah. But I would suggest the great thing about radio is that it, it still always comes down to one person on a microphone and that person can do something spectacular at any given time that they want to mm -hmm. 
when you do your shows on GabNet, I listen and I'm going, this is spectacular radio. This is a remarkably talented, gifted broadcaster. If you went on uh, traditional AM or FM radio stations today, you would do more than fine because you are an incredibly talented person. And there are other incredibly talented people because when you get on the, the radio, you're constantly challenging yourself. Yeah. How can I say something that's provocative, funny? You're always challenging yourself. Yeah. I'll tell you a great, it seems uh, out of the box, but it's not. I'll tell you a great quick Casey Kasem story. Okay, tell us that. Now, when you listen to Casey Kasem today, believe it or not, they have sold that show from the 70s, and it's played on adult contemporary stations around the country on Sundays. They still play it. Really? And uh, also, it's also on Sirius Satellite Radio. They still play it. Why? Because if you listen to it today, you sit there and you go, I knew he was good. I had no idea he was that good. I had no idea he was that good at the time because it was, good. it was ubiquitous and there were a lot of great disc jockeys. Well, now there are fewer great disc jockeys. It becomes very clear, but there's more to it. For a short period of time, Casey Kasem, uh, quote, re re reported to me when I was at ABC. Mm -hmm. And I got to learn how that show was made. And for years I, I thought that his four-hour show where he introduced songs yeah. and he spoke between songs, I thought that that four-hour show he would lay down voice tracks and it would take him 50 minutes. That's what I yeah. thought. He sat in the studio. Uh, that he'd sit in the studio and re he'd record it and it would take him about no, 50 I minutes. I bet he sat in the studio while the music was playing. It's worse. Really? At the end of an eight hour session. Eight hours? He would say, I've done 20 of the songs. I'll come back tomorrow and do the other 20. He re-recorded those breaks 10, 20, 30 times till in his mind they were absolutely perfect, that they were spectacular. He would fight with the scriptwriter over every word of those scripts, whether it was appropriate for him to say, was there a better word we could do? He sweated every detail oh, of that Jesus. show. So what did he do? He created art, and art is timeless. Yeah. And that's why if I listen to it now, if yeah. you listen to it now, it's amazing. Okay, now, uh, you know, you have an immaculate grasp of the history of broadcasting. Probably far more than even I, and I thought that I did. You made the history of broadcasting. Well, it's different. Uh, quit, uh, quit with that already. Okay. Uh, because I'm, I, I don't take compliments well. No, that's your problem, not mine. Uh, 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 excluding current uh, a company, well, who is the best radio broadcaster you ever heard? There were a number of them depending on the genre. There were a number of them betting. A, I believe that, excluding you, the best <laughs> the best telephone talk show host yeah. to it was Brad Crandall. Yeah, Brad Crandall was a surprisingly young man who had a huge voice. Yeah, and an amazing command of the language. And he came from Canada, and he came and worked at WNBC in New York. And the poor man, he was probably only about thirty five. He sounded fifty five. He's probably yeah. only about thirty five. He had an accident in a swimming pool, and that ended his career. His brain never worked the same again. Wow. But Brad Crandall was astonishing. Yeah. Gene Shepard was astonishing. Shepard, Shep was... And the yeah. interesting thing about Gene Shepard is if you go and listen to recordings of him before 1963 or 4, you'll hear a lot of hesitation yeah. and us mm -hmm. and us as he's telling his stories. And, and just FYI, what Gene Shepard did was something I've never heard anybody do again. Every night he would tell a story for 45 minutes, beginning, middle, end, and he'd yeah. tell a story. No guests, no phone calls. Told a story. And he did that from 1955 to 1974 or 5. Before 1965, his first five or ten years, there was hesitation. There was hesitation. There were great stories. But then after 1964, he had his confidence. He had his 20,000 hours in the seat. Yeah. And, and he couldn't be touched. The level of confidence was stunning. I got to know Shep uh, in, in uh, my uh, days in New York City. Knew him through my friend Earl Dowd, who used to have him over to dinner. Right. Right? And, um, I see, because I didn't grow up in New York, I never knew how hot and how revered Gene Shepard was. All radio was local. 
Right. Okay. So if you were Gene Shepard, nobody knew who you were in Cleveland. Right. All right. So I did not have that. But uh, here's this guy I'm having. Uh, I'm at Earl's house. We're having dinner, and he's uh, he's going on about some story about how his father took him out on a trip, and you know how you get to the fork in the road, and you don't know whether to go left or whether you know how to go right. I mean, he could take a two-minute story and stretch it out into 45 minutes. And he's telling this story, and I'm kind of getting a little, you know, I'm not in awe of him, so I, I kind of excuse myself from the table and I go into the living room while he's still entertaining the table, right? And I turn on the television set, and it's the Joe Franklin Show here in New York, and his guest is guess who? Gene Shepard. And guess what story he's telling? Same story. The same exact story he was telling at the dinner table. The fascinating thing about his ability to oh, tell... In case people don't know Gene Shepard, a Christmas story is Gene Shepard. He wrote the story and, and he's he the narrated it. Yeah. What's amazing is once when I was 20 and I worked at the FM station, WOR AM is the station he yeah. was on. It was number one station in New York City and in America. That was on the 24th floor of the building. Mm -hmm. I worked at the FM, owned by the same company. That was on the second floor of the building. That's all you yeah. need to know. One day, another kid and I dared each other to go watch Gene Shepard. We dared each other. Yeah. It was a big deal in our minds because we had grown up in New York. We get on the elevator at 10 o'clock. We go up to the, the studio. We find him. Happy to see us. Couldn't have been more gracious. But here was the most amazing thing that I learned. He's talking to us in the hallway. We're having a conversation with freaking Gene Shepard. Yeah. And then it's 10, 14, 30. Yeah. He says, excuse me. He walks into his studio commits 45 minutes of magic and mystery, comes back out and picks up the conversation exactly where it left off, but here was the thing, and others have confirmed this. In front of him for this 45-minute monologue, yeah. no guests, no phone calls, in front of him for the 45-minute monologue was one piece of paper, four inches by one inch, and it had two words on it. And when he got off the air, he threw it away. That was his entire show prep. He'd walk into that studio with two words on a piece of paper every night. Because he was a great storyteller. Astonishing storyteller. Uh, I, I, I would say, you see, if I had to answer that question, who was yes. the best uh, radio personality to me that I ever heard? Again, we go local. We go to San Francisco. And we go to the guy who influenced me the, more than anybody. Don Sherwood. You, you got it. Now, I have a question he for you. He owned that fucking town. I know. Town. Now, I have a question for you. Yeah. I've listened to recordings of Don Sherwood. You don't get it? And right. I didn't grow up there. Yeah. So I don't get it. You don't now, get it. Now, tell me what he did. You know what he did and what he taught me? You listened to Don Sherwood because you were listening to somebody's life as it was going on from day to day. He would talk about stuff that was happening in his life and people he went out with the night before. What, there was just something where he brought you in and was, it was a personable kind of style. I don't think that you can understand why Don Sherwood was good by listening to him for one night or two nights or maybe even a week. You have to listen to him over a year and then you get it. You go, this man is absolutely riveting. Plus he had a very good comedic style. And um, I was very privileged that once I wrote him and I said, uh, you know, I was just a kid at the time, I would love to see you do your show, and he invited me down to watch him do his show. Uh, and I would say that if there was anybody, there are several people that have influenced me, over, because we're all, we're, none of us are original, we're all a combination of all the people who have influenced us. Uh, if I had to say that there was one person who had the largest influence on who I am in broadcasting, it was Don Sherwood. And the other one was Jack Parr, and they both had something very similar. They wore their hearts on their sleeve. They would say what they thought. They would tell you what was going on in their mind. They would, they would let you have an entry into their soul. And, and that's the way I always did broadcasting. I did it right from, from, the, from the heart, yeah. Well, Don had a 50 share. Oh, it was amazing. It was amazing what he had. Yeah. And he also did some other smooth things. 
when a new broadcaster, a new general manager, or a new big morning man would come to the city of San Francisco, yeah. Don Sherwood would welcome them by name. Yes. On a competing station. Yes. He would welcome them to his city, and now I will eat you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and he did. Yes. Nobody could come close. Nobody could come close. I mean, close. You, would, uh, you would go to work, and the people would go to work in the morning, and all, uh, they, very few transistor radios around, but if there were, all of them were turned to, tuned to Don Sherwood. Carter yeah. B. Smith, who worked with him at yeah, worked KSFO with him. and yeah. is, was, became a friend of mine, said exactly what you said. He said, there's nothing I could explain to you about why that was successful. Yeah. There, there, and, and even his son says, you know, my dad just, just sort of talked. He really didn't do stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, you, it, it, you couldn't, I could never explain to somebody why Don Sherwood was so great and what he, why he was such an influence on me. But that would be my choice, you know. Uh, and there, there have been a lot of other great broadcasters that I've heard and, and that I've admired, but the one that had the biggest influence on me was Don Sherwood. Hey, listen, thank you. It's you a know. privilege to be in your studio. Yes, it's a privilege to have you here. This and, is, and cutting edge, I'd like to point out. Yeah. Did anybody write anything about this? Let's see here. I hope not. Uh, Walter Sterling, Kevin Stauber says, I remember when Lex used to complain about Howard stealing bits from him. And he did back then. Who's Lex? Alex. Oh, Alex. <laughs> he didn't put the A in there. No, uh, 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 no. Uh, Howard never stole bits from me. I'll tell you who stole bits from me. It was Imus. I believe that. I, I would be uh, do my show at uh, uh, WPLJ, and uh, I would uh, do some bit or something like between 5 and 6 in the morning. And then I'd get in my car, and I'd start driving. I'd tune into Imus, and he's doing my bit. I'm just a, I'm just Howard amazed. Never, what Howard stole from me was what I do. That's what if he stole anything. You gave him permission to do what he did. <laughs> That's you, a good point. Your That's can, a good point. Your candor yeah. and your anger yeah. on MCA and PLJ was unique, and that gave others who wanted to be yeah. candid and angry permission to do it. Well, I said that I because no one else had done it. You know, one time I, I, I listened to an interview with Howard, because I tried to never listen to Howard. Uh, but I listened to an interview with Howard, and he talked about growing up and so on and so forth. And it, you could almost have had me sell, tell you my story, and they would have been in sync with each other. I mean, we grew up with the same kind of influences and the same kind of badgering at school and all of that. And uh, I said... Uh, this guy didn't steal my act. This guy's just another me, you know. But the place where he got smart is I had two careers. I had my radio career and I had my Midnight Blue career, which was the sex show on, on cable. And I never thought of combining the two. He did. That's right. Yep. That's yep. right. Yep. So You gave him permission yeah. to, to, to be who he is. Thank you very Thank much, you Walter. Very much. I really you, appreciate, I it. appreciate it. His name it. is Walter Sterling. Uh, his, he's also been in the business for years, and I've known him as, 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 as Walter Sabo. Uh, but uh, Mr. Sterling, it's been really a pleasure having you here, and uh, I'm sure everybody really enjoyed what you had to say. The next time you're here, we'll do more, okay? Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Walter Sterling. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Okay, have a good sleep in the in the in the, the best uh, guest room in New York. In the best guest room in New York. Yeah, great. It's a great hotel. It's yeah. Hotel. Anyway, uh, it's time now for everybody to start calling in. Let me uh, let me uh, uh, let me see here. There we go. Uh, we get that. Okay. All right. Now we're fine. You know, when anybody leaves like that, the picture gets brighter. I don't know why that happens. I can't tell, but let me let me t let me try and change my picture just a little bit. Anyway, the lines are open in case anybody feels like calling. Uh, let me just uh, bring this down a few notches a little bit here. Uh, okay, there we go. Wait a minute, hold on. Okay, Mark is calling. Uh, ho hold on a second, Mark. And Tom Yamaguchi is calling. Uh, and, wait a minute, there's Mark calling. Uh, hold on a second, guys. I'm just trying to do something here. I'm trying to configure my, my video. Um, 
bring Walter back. He was yeah. great. <laughs> I was going to say. That was, uh, a, can, that uh, was amazing. Really, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, hold on a second. I'm trying to, uh, uh, oh, let, me, let me go okay, and then let me open this up again. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get my my video uh, in, in some kind of decent shape. Hold on. Wait a minute. I'll do this, and then I'll bring this up a little bit. There we go. Uh, because I, I I turned down my video uh, a bit. Okay. Well, let's let's have it stay that way, and we'll be okay. And then let me add uh, Patrick to the group, and I think we're okay. Let me open up here, and uh, now let me uh, go okay there, and now let me go to the panel. There they are, ladies and gentlemen. Ta-da! Uh, who, who do we got there? Let's see here. We uh, oh, and we're getting Ray Renati. God, wow! And Jeff Stein. Oh, this is the fastest we've had a citizen panel going. Oh, here comes Scott Boddicker. It seems that when when Phil isn't going to be here, here comes Kevin. <laughs> Boy, this is the fastest we've had a citizen panel in uh, 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 years. Uh, uh, put some light on yourself, will you, Scott? You're, you're like I was walking around I was laying in my bed and yeah. I walked over to my desk I'm sorry yeah wait a minute oh, yeah. here comes Vernon Nunn Alex that was great yeah we're one short of a oh, full shoot. house <laughs> one short of a full house in uh, how many seconds here I, I don't know um, but anyway uh, what, what, well let's talk a little bit about it great you liked it you enjoyed it huh very oh, much yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, yes, Mark. Uh, you, you you have something hey, to say? A couple of things. Yeah. I think a couple of weeks ago, Stern spoke very highly of you on his radio show, and he mentioned you in the same breath as Bob Grant. What what, what did he say? He was talking about radio back when he was younger, yeah. and he said, besides you, he said there was Bob Grant. I'm paraphrasing it here. Well, but he he actually he. He actually had said that it wound up in a book somewhere, but then he never admitted it after that. He would ask, people would say, "What do you, well, Alex Bennett, blah blah blah," and he would go, "Who's Alex Bennett?" You know, he would deny my very existence. But I'm glad finally, in his old age, he recognized pops. You know, I mean, um, um, the other thing is that Walter mentioned Beasley Broadcasting. Yeah. Uh, listen, and, wait a minute, hold on a second. Uh, I know that I think somebody's trying to call me right now, and uh, I can't take the call because you're not calling on the, uh, 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 you're not calling by just calling GabNet Live. You're doing it trying to get in on one of the old thingies. I don't know what happened. It may be Renee. Renee. She's, uh, she just came online. Yeah. Uh, I, but uh, I don't know what happened to Ray Renati there. He kind of disappeared. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'm I'm amazed that he that he said that you know he. Well, he's been making amends with a lot of people over the last couple of years that I've yeah. noticed. Yeah, he's a lot of people that he's uh, had his his words with over the years. He's made amends with. I, well, I've I mean, noticed. Walter told me once when uh, told me once. Here we go. We got a full house already. Uh, Walter told me years ago that because he was uh, consulting with Howard. And uh, he told me that Howard had uh, told him that I was one of his, you know, influences. So, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, that made me feel good to hear it. But when I was uh, uh, when I was working in San Francisco and we were competing because he was on uh, on the San Jose station, he used to always go on the air and say I stole my act from him. You know. And of course, that wasn't yeah, true. Yeah, that's why I brought it up, Alex, because I, I distinctly remember you saying the same thing back that one time, and it was probably a short time yeah. on Live 105 that you guys were, you know, swapping spit back and forth. Mm -hmm. But that's why I brought it up because I remember that distinctly that you know he was saying that about you and you were saying that about him. It may not have lasted well, very I long, mean, but I just uh, I let me face it, there is that. there is an age difference of about. What I guess he's seventy five, sixty five now, something like that. Yeah, yeah, there is that age difference. Yeah, yeah, there's an age difference of about twelve years. So I mean, how could I have stolen from him? <laughs> you know, unless I deep, uh, deep right, I, right. I, I deeply that's, that's, went that's down my, into his mother's that's my point, uterus. That's what I always used to defend. Yeah, 
Yeah. I was always defending you because you were there first. Well, you see, I mean, the, the reason that bothered me, it didn't bother me because I want everybody to say, oh, I got, you know, Alex Bennett is my influence and blah, blah, blah. I don't give a shit, really. Yeah, uh, yeah. But what does bother me is the way in which he did it, it made it look like I was stealing from him. And that I didn't right. like. That I felt was, you know, was terrible. Well, me and my buddy that used to listen to you all the time used to sit there and say, that's bullshit. And we used to boycott Howard for that reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it also doesn't make it very easy for you to get work elsewhere because there are people, for instance, if you had somebody in another town, as I said earlier, you know, radio was local. And in, in those days, and so nobody knew who Alex Bennett was, say in Reno, Nevada. <laughs> okay, is yeah. an example. Uh, but maybe because he was syndicated, they knew who Howard was. So right. you became known as the guy because he had the bully pulpit. You became known as the guy who stole from Howard Stern. Yep. You know, and and that's what I didn't like. Uh, that's that's what used to piss us off. Also, what I didn't like is when when uh, uh, they let me go at Sirius, uh, he did have two channels. Uh, and yeah. I did approach them about hiring me and putting my show on one of his channels, and I never got any positive response back. And I felt that if I was that much of an influence on him, he should have felt, hey, you know, what's it gonna cost me out of my $70 million a year I make, $100,000 to have Alex Bennett on one of my stations? Go ahead, do especially, it. Especially when they lost Bubba, they could have slipped you in there right there easily. Exactly, exactly. The love sponge? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was no loss. <laughs> an, an act I never quite understood. Okay, and I, I knew Bubba and I knew his crew because they were working many times out of out of New York, and I could never figure out why, uh, wh what it was that made him even partially successful. Now you live down in that area, Mark. Tell me, Bubba the Love I Sponge. Have, I have no clue, but I will tell you one thing. Yeah. You mentioned Beasley Broadcasting. Yeah. They fired because they own the radio stations here. Mm -hmm. They fired the only decent DJ, Liz Wilde, and she's great. And she's she's like you. She wants to go back on the air. Yeah. So she owns this beautiful art gallery now with her husband in Bradenton. Yeah. But she wants to go back on the air, and it's very hard. And yeah. Once you, once you lose uh, your, you know, once you lose your job in this business, it's hard to get another one. Uh, and, uh, you know, I knew the day that they fired me at Sirius, I said, I'll probably never work again. Uh, you know, and uh, uh, I, I, however, I've known Walter forever. And uh, Walter always tells me, well, call this guy or call that guy. You know, and I, I, I just... Uh, I don't want to face disappointment, okay? You know, I don't want to face disappointment. But anyway, uh, Walt has been a friend of mine for a long time, and he, when I lost my, uh, when I lost my job at uh, CNET, uh, the guy who was the program director there, who did like me, and we got along great, said to me, "You know what I would do? I would get a hold of Walter Sabo in New York, and I said, his name is really Walter Sabo." And I said, why? He said, well, Walter's a very big consultant. I said, I know that. He said, he loves your work. He said, you should call him. And when I called him, that's when I got the, you know, he walked me through Sirius and he said, I want people to see you. And one thing led to another and I got some work there. You know, so Walter was my, was my savior. So, yeah. Yes, Tom. But well, you didn't immediately go to Sirius because because you actually came back to that same station, right? Which was KNBR, right? Yeah. Well, what happened was here. No, I came back. Oh, well, I did KNBR for one night in San Francisco. I went to New York and I worked for my friend Steve at his business doing late night porno programming on uh, on the channels here in New York, cutting and editing and creating commercials for him. Yeah. Uh, See, and, and that was wrong. It was KNEW. I'm sorry. And, and, KNEW? Oh, uh, yeah, I did KNEW for, God, six weeks. 
you did that tech thing with that tech guy. Oh no, that was over at CNET. Oh, yeah, that was. I see. I went over okay. to see. Here's a here's a fun story. CNET uh, had a frequency. All right, and what they how they had that frequency was they were renting it from Clear Channel, and finally they fired me and got rid of me. So I'm out of work for maybe a month. Okay, and they decide to give up the lease. It was it's the thing they call an LMA. They decide to give up the lease. Immediately, I get a call from one of my old bosses who's working over at Clear Channel, running that, and he says, hi, he says, uh, listen, uh, they just dropped the, uh, their deal with us, and we've got an empty station, I got a fill Monday, would you come do a show for us? So mm -hmm. I went right back to the same frequency, working <laughs> with, a, with a new show. Uh, but that lasted for six weeks until the program, the national program director of Clear Channel heard my show and since he do, he's the guy who defined talk radio as being right wing talk, mm -hmm. uh, I I was out. He he simply said, uh, is, "Is he kidding?" When he listened to me, because my politics were all left. Uh, uh, first, Ray had his hand up earlier, and then uh, Tom. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I I found that whole conversation fascinating, and I, I hope I hope he writes a book or you guys write something together. <laughs> And that this all this history just doesn't disappear into nowhere yeah. because it's it's incredible um, and it brought so many memories back I had this hippie cousin when I was a kid uh, who used to listen to all those FM stations all the time and my parents always listened to, to KSFO and KGO but when they were gone we'd listen to those FM stations that you were talking about and I was just fascinated with those things yeah like surgic Sean Donahue uh, and the music they would play and stuff, I was just like, what is, this? I was, you know, I was only a little kid, but I, I was, it, it was, it was, um, it was definitely cutting edge. It was something else. Well, I didn't come into, yeah. into convergence with uh, pro what they call progressive music at the time. Oh, I mean, no, no, it wasn't progressive music. Uh, no. I, when, when I went to the Quake, they were that. playing whatever, you know, whatever that was at that time, like Devo and, uh, you know, these weird off-brand groups. And uh, it wasn't until they, I w went somewhere where they were playing alternate rock, alternative rock they were calling it, that I yeah. felt at home. Because the music perfectly fit my style, you know. Yeah, so. Live 105 and all that. But, but before that even, in the late 60s, the FM stations were just like the wild, wild west, you know. Yeah, like you said, people would just bring in their album collections. Yeah, and play basically, them. they're playing their album collections, and and pr part of the reason was, it, and, and and Walter stated it admirably, was that the stations didn't give a sh the ownerships didn't give a shit. They just wanted to keep sound going on their station. So whatever we wanted to do, that was okay. Mark's getting a kick out of that because you remember uh, that kind of. Well, thing. You, you know, I was so young. I knew there was something going on because that's what my sister was playing. Yeah. <laughs> I recognized John Zachary's voice because uh. I heard him on TV. Mm -hmm. And now I'm hearing his voice on radio. And he's not, you know, the Zachary I know, but now he's playing cool music at the time. Um, oh, but you still had that Zachary. John Zachary was a television personality who hosted horror films. Right. Okay, and um, I used to watch him. Uh, yeah, uh, and and Zachary, if I can approximate the way he talked, kind of talked like this a lot. This is how he talked. This was uh, John Zachary. He was like he was like that off the air too. Uh, and uh, but somehow that style did very well in radio. Was you that know? the creature feature guy? Well, I mean, yeah, in New York he did. I would he oh, do? Well, he had a, there was a name for his show. Oh, we had a different guy here. Oh, yeah. I mean, he and I went out to, uh, he and I decided we'd go out one day to the beach and just uh, go get a hot dog somewhere out in Long Island. And uh, we get there and we're sitting there, we're munching on our hot dogs, and, and a couple of girls are staring at us. And Zachary looks over at me and says, I think they just saw this jockey and a horror show host. <laughs> <laughs> I loved Zach. Ours loved was him. Bob Wilkins. Yeah. Well, in, yeah. in the Bay Area, yeah, there was yeah. Bob Wilkins. Yeah. Um, so, so, Alex, you used to hate being called a disc jockey. 
<laughs> well, I was uh, to begin with. I never considered myself a disc jockey. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I think I, most of them. I, I did, did not define like myself both. by playing records. Okay. Right. But I hated the term disc jockey even when I was playing records because it's kind of like if you have a job and I call you a desk jockey, you know, <laughs> or I call you if you're if you're the cleaning person a mop jockey, you know. <laughs> I just I just consider it a pejorative. Well, yeah. because it just sounds like you're putting a record on a, a record player and walking away. Yeah. There's no skill to it. Yeah, that's it's, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and so I I never liked the term disc jockey. I don't know who came up with that. It might have been uh, uh, Alan Freed, who came mm -hmm. up with it and should have been shot for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, and yeah. I really like what you say about Jack Parr too, because I just when I watch his uh, repeats of the Tonight Show, he had the Tonight Show, right? Right. right. On TV. Cool. I mean, he was so good. He was just so good. I mean, I know Johnny Carson was great, but Jack Parr. There was just something about him, and like you say, he, he wore his heart on his sleeve. So you right. wanted to watch him because you knew he was going to well, tell you something also, personal. Also, you, you, there was a continuing kind of, it was almost like a soap opera that you create about your day-to-day -day life. Yeah. And so you tuned in the next night to see how something was going to resolve itself that he had talked about the night before. And Don Sherwood was much the same way in San Francisco. Yeah, uh, and sure. I adopted that kind of style myself. I would always talk about what was happening with me and, and so on, or some fight I was having with somebody. So people would want to tune in the next day to hear how that resolved itself. Oh, yeah. That and the fact that I had people on that were funnier than I was. You know. <laughs> and even with some of these night, these yeah. night jockeys, you, or, I, don't, I hate to say that jockey, some of these night <laughs> guys... You could go down and knock on the door, and sometimes you could get inside and sit there and talk with them. Oh yeah, I had yeah. a lot of people do that. I got laid that go way. Down and I, talk I got, to I, Sean got I got laid. I got I got laid that way a lot. You know, some woman <laughs> to come knocking on the door and go, "I'm, hey, are you Alex Ben? I want to come see the show." Fine, come on well, in. I, I didn't do that because most of them were guys, but you know, that's yeah. Different. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, I, I treated the guys very nicely, but I, you know, yes, uh, Mark. Um, when I was working overnights when I lived in New York when in the 80s and the early 90s we used to bother poor old Danny Stiles and oh he was so much fun and he passed away very recently too yeah and but that was one of the nice things that you could call you know say say what you want about the Strauss family yeah they kept they kept the audience engaged yeah. You know, at all hours. I mean, if you were insomniac, who's on? You, oh, it's yeah. Candy Clark and, you know, it's uh, um, Long John Nemble and Candy Jones. You know, there was always something interesting. Mm. Yeah. So I just don't see that at all today. Yeah. You know, it's all programs. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, uh, it, 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 Radio doesn't exist anymore like it did. I mean, and the reason yeah. it doesn't is exactly what, what Walter was talking about. When it was highly competitive, when you had 20 different owners who owned the stations in a city, uh, and they only were owned one station in that city, or an AM and an FM, let's say. Which that's all they were allowed to own, right? Yeah, you were only allowed to own an AM and an FM, uh, and you could own a TV... But you couldn't own a newspaper and an AM, FM, and a TV. You had to have an AM and an FM and a newspaper, or an AM and a TV, I think, and a newspaper. But you couldn't, you could, in other words, you could only have three of something, okay, in a given city. And you could only have seven of those across the country, all right? So if ABC had local stations, they had them in San Francisco, they had them in New York, they had them in LA, they had them in Chicago. I can't remember. Maybe I, I don't know what the other town would be that they would have been in. Uh, but you could have seven stations. And, and, and you know, it, 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 so 21 stations all in all. And you had to show you had the financial ability to, to, to keep them on the air. Yes, Tom. Yeah, and uh, your friend Walter was talking about the law that uh, from 66 saying that the AM and FM could simultast. And uh, that's obviously changed because here uh, the uh, K, uh, KCBS uh, is actually uh, uh, have brought has both AM and FM, 
uh, they're simulcasting now. They're all yeah, news station. Hmm. Okay. Uh, that's right. changed. Yeah. Yes, uh, Ray. I, I kind of have a funny studio story. A long, long time ago, I was just doing this student film at uh, KTVU, mm -hmm. and, and I and I had to. I was a newscaster, and I had to. I sat in Dennis Richmond's chair because the guy who was that, making the movie worked there. Yeah. And he had his chair, it was set so uncomfortably. I guess it was so that he was forward and awake, and it, I couldn't sit in it. So I adjusted it, and the guy, and the guy who works there goes, oh, my God, don't touch the chair. And I completely screwed it up. And so I, when I went home that night, I watched uh, the news, and the whole night, Dennis Richmond is, like, futz, futzing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I spent the entire hour. It was hilarious. You know, you, you, <laughs> it felt really bad, but it was also yeah. one of the funniest it's, things I'd ever seen. If you were in TV, <laughs> you could probably get away with that, and radio never could because every three hours there was a new person using the studio. Yeah. You know? Well, and, also, Dennis Richmond wasn't... I don't know if he was nice or not, but... There was a lot of problems uh, with the Me Too movement and Dennis Richmond. Well, I knew Dennis Richmond, and I liked Dennis Richmond. And I, you know me. I if I have any much. excuse not to like somebody, I'll take it. You know. <laughs> By the way, uh, to change the subject, Renee has, has, has been nice enough not to open a box. <laughs> two boxes. <laughs> two, two boxes? Why are they two boxes? Well, I didn't tell you what the other thing was, but I don't know how new it is, me, so I was, I was just going to show it to you, Jay. And this one I'm not going to wait. Let me kind of make her full screen here. Hold on. Oh, 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 you didn't. I did. Ooh, I got one of well, those. I had to. It wasn't I did it because I wanted to spend money. Okay. It's the computer that we're talking on now. The logic board is dying, and it's not being supported anymore by Apple, so I have to put my photos somewhere. So I didn't have a choice. So that I had to do. But this I have to install this weekend. So you are not, I mean, I'll unbox it, but we're not going to do a whole lot of talking about it unless somebody else ha already has one. Uh, I, I find them a complete waste I have of time. The older, I have the older version. That's what it looks like now? Yeah. 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 It's just okay. A square you know what I'll do? Can, you, can you move your camera? Can you move your camera so your head is a little more towards the sure. top of the screen? Because what I have now is I have you full screen and there. yes yes and all the okay. people are below you okay let's open up the first box okay i don't care about okay. the, about the airport uh yeah I, I didn't think you cared about a hard drive <laughs> yeah. but mine's dying so it's funny because my computer was dying and i said said to uh apple i said my computer's dying what age is it and you get they go to 2012 and i said great i'll just back everything up in my time capsule and they're like yeah that's a 2010 and i'm like <laughs> you're gonna screw me up <laughs> yeah no i just so, i never got a time capsule i just it's cheaper to just get a, a an external drive and do it there same thing yeah, that's what i did yeah well now they put of course the time capsule okay. is the airport well, wait a now, now if you're gonna open up that box open it up yeah, where no, we can see you open it up okay now we'll tell them what this is this is like a it's like what i have only it's not what i have actually but it's a well it's like what you have but it is for the iphone instead of the gopro okay and you can so, um, shall we uh, shall we say this as well uh you can uh, uh, uh nine, get this for 129 dollars on amazon well yeah and or, or buy it from apple whichever way you want to get it there's this is the least expensive one that that's out of all the ones that are out yeah but there are other options that are like four dollars cheaper okay. so i'm not well, sure well, I'm gonna let, it. let's get to the, let's get to this so that uh, uh i was looking there are some that are a lot more expensive too yeah well so originally these were these were and i think alex isn't yours metal uh mine is uh let me see here where is it yeah, i have no idea where it is now oh, here it is here it is here it is uh, uh, I gotta get rid of my earphones here for a second. So these used to be made. Oh, you're opening that. The oh, Warriors are ahead. 102 this to 72. Is, uh, yeah, I'm watching the game. Thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> Alex is uh, metal. Sure, this is the latest and greatest uh, one. Farm, and it's actually former classic. mechanically uh, adept. I don't know if it has it's, any power it's on really it. Really right quite there. nice because it makes it really light. The other thing that oh, they did with this, there's two things they did with this. One is, of course, they have a mount for your tripod. So yeah. if yeah, if you have to hold it for a long period of time and it yeah. is 
get tired using that, you can put it on a tripod. Yeah. So is yours metal, Alex? Mine's uh, it's not it's uh, it's plastic, really. Part of it and part of it, I think, is metal. Uh, okay. So but but it's it, 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 it's not really working right right now. I have to it, because usually the the screen should go into effect once I turn it on. But it is it's a steady cam and it keeps things steady. As you can see, when I move it, it's always staying at level. At a level. Uh, in fact, let me let me just uh, let me do something here. Does that one so follow you around, see. Renee? Yeah, what, what, actually, what, 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 it can do that. What, what, and the other really weird thing that it can do, which I what, saw on the web, but I don't know. It actually can do a 365 degree shot for you. You see that no matter how I put this thing, it stays straight, okay? And it makes for a very smooth uh, uh, thing, so, yeah. Now, the other thing that's good about this is, is because of the clamping system that you just saw, it doesn't matter if you're using the Samsung or any of the other ones, it should fit without a problem. Yeah. And if I, set it up correctly because you can set it for landscape or portrait you just quickly do it by changing this right here or weighting it correctly so that it'll actually change it so as you're walking around and taking pictures and trying not to kill yourself this thing will actually take care of all of that okay so now, so now wait a minute now, let, a, now wait a minute when you use it where is the where is the uh, 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 camera itself. I, in other words, where's the screen, rather? Right. In, uh, it depends on. What, do you want it landscape or do you want it portrait? Uh, I want it landscape. I mean, where uh, can you see the screen when you're using it? Well, there's uh, on the screen. Okay, so one thing that you guys have to be aware of um, is that you can use this without its uh, software, but they do have software. And I looked at it really quickly and I was downloading it. The software is nice because it has a whole bunch of buttons here in case you want to just edit your video right in front of you. Yeah. But what's nice on these things, and Alex, do you have this as well? A series of buttons on the handle? I have buttons on the handle here. I can't make this yeah. thing stop blinking right now. That's the only problem. So you can make it zoom in, you can make it zoom out, you can tilt it, you can change it, you can, and you do all of that from the handle here. What's really nice about this one is it's got 15 hour battery life in it. Oh, really? So not only can you, yeah, you can charge your phone while you're shooting, which is pretty darn cool too. I like that. Hold on a second, let me see. Who People are shooting uh, entire independent films with those things. Now. Oh yeah, well this is this is a GoPro here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. This is just for your cell phone. Yeah. And so now you've okay, got something. Okay. So now, that's wait a minute. So, what, really so when, like uh, let me ask you a question, out. though. What I'm asking is, when you're shooting with it, okay, when you're shooting with it, uh, which way do you look at it? In other words, okay, l go landscape, and then show me like if you're going to start shooting. I have to switch it up. Well, I don't. You know what? So. I haven't used their software yet. So no, no, I can't no, no, no. All I'm that. asking you is how do you see what you're Better shooting? Landscape. How do you see what you're shooting? I haven't downloaded the software. I don't know. Well, no, but, but all I'm saying is when you oh. hold it up, do you uh, hold it up right. with, the, with, the, with the screen facing you or do you hold it up with the, I would imagine you hold it up with the screen facing you because you would have that other, that the lens on the other side shooting right so doing what it so, normally so does. Hold, hold it up so like you would be shooting just hold it up like okay. you'd be shooting okay up on, higher so we can to change the don't worry about that i just want to see okay so let me just turn on so let me just turn on some video then hold on well, the, and i'm not you don't have to turn on the screen or anything i just want you to hold it up like you would be holding it up if you were shooting with it I would be holding. It, hold on. It would be like just like this. Okay, so you'd be if looking. Would, you'd be looking at the. Like you'd be looking at the screen. Exactly. Okay, that's and what I, I was can, wondering. I would either be using the software on the screen, or I would be using the control buttons on the actual handle. Yeah. Uh, okay. So if I was doing okay. like this, but right. I haven't downloaded well, the software, cool. and that's this actually going to have a very big for one hundred and twenty nine bucks. It's very cool. You know. Yeah. I, I might even get one for myself since I like shooting with the uh, iPhone, since its picture is extraordinary. 
you know. Yep. I really like the fact that it's got extra ports. I like the fact that it's got 15 hours worth of battery well, let me, life. Let me know how you like it, because if you like it, I'll get one, you know? Okay. I'll okay. have to use it over the weekend. But when I go to shoot lava, I'm not sure I'm taking my big camera. Yeah. Right. Be, just because you have to run fast. Well, I, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey Patrick, did you see the top of the crater where you where you were? Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, the part of its mis so. What happens is if you drive to the top of Kilauea, there's actually a lookout area where Patrick showed us the photo, and it, it was a ranger station and a driveway and a parking lot and a lookout, and it ain't there. It's not much of that left anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! I was just there uh, last year. Yeah, a lot of that's gone now. Oh my gosh! I got some incredible photos from there because it was erupting at the time, but it wasn't, you know, all over the place. I put, I did a huge, a really long exposure. Let's not go into an elongated uh, volcano talk tonight, especially okay. since <laughs> I saw the video of the people in uh, uh, Guatemala uh, oh. who so are up uh, yeah. there. They've got an ash problem. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, you and know. And that's scary because wow. the ash problem is bad. Yeah. It, that's what we had in Mount St. Helens. Right. Uh, uh, so, how are you tonight, Patrick? I just want to check in with you. I'm doing, doing all right, all right. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> we got no slap back. By the way, yeah, you know, we had that. all that slap back that night. We did everything. We turned everything off. We turned everything on. Everybody hung up. Other people hung. <laughs> and we couldn't get rid of the slap back. The next night, everything perfect. And I was wondering what would happen when you called. And it's fine tonight. Well, and, it, and, and the whole reason I called is I, I heard the, uh, Renee last night say that she was going to uh, strip. And I just had to call what? and hear that and see it and then it turned out it was this gopro thing so yes it's, it's, thank it's, you <laughs> like, well supposedly i smoking last supposedly night? <laughs> unboxing gets lots of viewers but unfortunately we lost viewers during that so well, you know I, I think you have to just do this segment you just i have think it's to, because the basketball game's about to end is it, oh yeah oh, so what's the score uh what really, four, what, yeah they're gonna beat him. This oh, is yeah. it, right? Oh, yeah. This it's last game. Is this it? This is the last game. Boy. Yeah. It's just banking. Did, did you see uh, 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 the gentleman from the Cavs that was just like, I am distraught and beside LeBron. myself. He's yeah, LeBron. 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 He, LeBron gave <laughs> up ten minutes ago. He was like, by the way, by the way, by the way, let's. I got to talk about uh, the man whose name we should not speak. Uh, Trump today the did, you, did you hear what he said today did you hear uh, yes that he was going to give a pardon to Muhammad Ali yeah he's going to commute his sentence really? what a and 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 Muhammad Ali's former lawyer had yeah. to write and say you can't do that because the Supreme Court got to the, him first and commuted his <laughs> yeah. sentence uh, he, he, we all knew it when we heard it. We heard the, we heard it, and we're like, "Didn't that ha happen?" And then all of a sudden, the next news report was, "And guess what? The Supreme Court had done in 19." Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they like, they had that. vacated the sentence because they considered it. Uh, they they proved it was unconstitutional. Well, he's got a he's got a bunch more to try too. Y yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I want him to be Snowden, but you know, we all all. We want that. Well, so Snowden, Snowden ha isn't under arrest. You know, isn't uh, there's no trial for Snowden. He hasn't been. He, but he can't come back in. He what can't is come it back in. Well, then he might get charged. Yes, uh, 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 Tom. Sorry. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I finally figured out what Trump's job actually is now. He, or at least he's figured out. He is the host of Celebrity Pardon. There you go. <laughs> the new show coming on NBC. Celebrity pardons, yeah, yeah. Get pardoned. <laughs> well, all of a sudden, he saw that he he did so well with his pardon of this woman who had was had spent twenty years in jail for drugs, and uh, I think he felt it made him look so good. He's going to now pardon thousands of people to look. Yeah, good. and the closer we get to election time, he's going to do more. 
He's going to pardon <laughs> himself. What he's going to do is he's going to pardon thousands. Of, want... He's going to Sorry. pardon thousands of people, so that when he finally pardons like Manafort and Cohn, you won't notice it because there'll be so many other people being pardoned yeah. as well. He'll just oh, open no. up pardon houses and in, in, across the country, pardon houses, and then he'll you know stuff them all into there. And then once they get there, they yeah. can, you know, just cut them loose once in a while. Yeah. Yes, uh, <laughs> Renee. So you, I want everybody to say, the, repeat after me. If he gets a chance, he will pardon himself. Oh, sure. There's oh, no sure. doubt. No one will. doubt that fact. No one doubt that. We, we should all have That's that in the middle of everybody else. Yep. So we won't notice. Yeah, but, well, hey, oh boy. Uh, okay, who asked what it looks like now? What? It's just a you know, it's, a, it's another expensive piece of Appleware, which the time you capsule get. looks like a couple of rolls of toilet paper. Yeah, and you don't need <laughs> it, it, uh, the only reason you want to get a time capsule is so that it coordinates with all your other furniture that you bought from Apple. <laughs> yeah. Does it have that an Alexa? Because oh, yeah. all that is all that is is a hard drive that's used as a backup, and I've got one here with six mega with six terabytes. How big is that one? It's, it still has the uh, <laughs> airport in it. Yeah, it still has the airport in it, and it's got three terabytes. Well, it's got the airport. What's the airport? How does that differ from a uh, uh, from a from a backup drive? It's That's the same. It's in route. there too. Well, you can back it up with Wi-Fi, oh, but it would oh, take oh, forever. It's the oh, Wi-Fi it's, inside. Oh, it's, it. oh, it's the Wi-Fi inside it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Mine right. is that like two. It looks like a Mac Mini. Yeah. Wait, hold on. There you go. <clears throat> My airport. Uh, Time capsule looks exactly like the mini, and they stack on top of each other. No, really. Yeah, see, I, so be careful because mine's that one. Yeah, it's outdated. Yeah. probably. See, yeah. and that's the whole thing. <laughs> like I'm like. Well, they're making yeah. my Mac Pro uh, a has been starting in uh, oh about October when they release a new operating system. It won't work on this machine. Yeah. So I've no, got to wait. Probably what's gonna happen? Yeah. So I'm gonna have uh, to. Well, they, people will. Keep, they'll keep, I think, upgrading this, uh, but it's uh, you know it, it, eventually people aren't going to make stuff that will work with this. Yeah, yes, uh, high Sierra. Pro? What? What are you going to say? MacBook Pro is going to be obsolete. No, no, I have a a, a Mac Pro. A Mac Pro. Yeah. Just, and the Warriors are champs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. Warriors are champs. Yeah. Oh, yep. Okay. Yeah, well, okay, another team that will not go to the White House. Anyway, yes, Mark, did you have exactly. your hand up? Mark, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Well, since, um, gee, that's interesting because this crapped down on me last week, too. Oh, baby, that's exactly, I've got that puppy right next to me, and what, it's, what, it's, it's, what, it. What, what is that? That's the, my, that's my old airport. Oh. But That's because just... Apple is no longer making this technology, I went with a Netgear Orbi. So oh, did after... you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I went with an Orbi. I have a network drive hooked up to it, so that way that'll handle my backups. Okay, but well, wait a minute. Now, the Orbi, if I'm not mistaken, is a uh, is a, literally a, a, a Wi-Fi you can put in that will take care of the whole house. It's a mesh network. It's great. Yeah. Uh, it sets up. It sets up very easily. It works. That's that's it. And you know, it's one less thing I got to deal with. And it's cheaper than an Apple product. Well, in yep. this, in this apartment, in this apartment, we've got, you know, we got eleven rooms or something. Yeah. And to, the the, the Wi-Fi is right here, okay. And for it to get to the living room, forget it. Especially with these walls, which are just absolute concrete. All right. So. What I did is I hardwired from this router to the bedroom. And then I put in an extender in the bedroom and it takes care of the rest of the house. And that's how I do it. But I don't know that that Orbi would take care from this room of the whole house. What's the square footage of the uh, apartment? Uh, 2,500 square feet. Yeah, it'll Damn, handle it. That is big. No, but it might not handle it because of the walls. That's what I'm saying. Um, this is rated 5,000 square feet. <laughs> yeah, but, but 5,000 square feet doesn't take into consideration density of walls. 
Alex, I'm telling you, it, this has been up. I mean, now how much did that cost? That's about three hundred bucks, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It, it's two pieces. It's the base and then a satellite. I'm covered. Twenty two hundred square feet. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And how many and how many uh, Ethernets can you put into it? Or like have coming out of this? It's, it's outrageous. I mean, it's like, wow. They really, they really made it like. No, but I mean, like I have, for instance, this modem has four Ethernet ports coming yeah, out of it. Look, How many yeah. are coming out of this, out of the Orbi? Four, but the satellite has four also. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah, there's like eight all together. I mean, it's, you know, and, and being that I'm getting into the home automation thing on my own, oh, yeah, you need it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So which way are you going in the home automation department? <sighs> I think mm -hmm. I'm going to go more towards the I'm sorry, which way? Alexa, Amazon. Are you really? Because I'm dabbling in the Lutron in the RA2 Select, and I'm trying to figure all that crap out. Wow, you're going with Lutron. I went with Hugh. I went with uh, Philips for my Phillips? life. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. I loved Philips. It came right up. It was wonderful. If you guys go to Home Depot and you have a light that you actually need to turn on it sometimes when you're home when you're away from home and it's just one it's just all it is is you take out your light bulb you put in the phillips piece you put your light bulb into the phillips piece you bring it up on your iphone you plug in the bridge and poof stuff you've got a light that you can turn on from anywhere in the planet welcome to alex tech, tech talk. Uh, sorry yeah Renee talk. Yeah. Well, that's, but anyway. Well, home automation is a thing. So you need the guys to So my draperies are going to be wired, meaning that I will be able, oh, anywhere in the world, I'll be able to close the drapes when the sun gets hot. Mark, see, it's not that bad. But see, the sun is really bad here. It's very bad. So at 2.30 in the afternoon, if those drapes don't go down, all sorts of things are going to happen. How many people are interested in this? Uh, home automation. Uh, <laughs> I got okay. a dog for that. I'm about to fall asleep. All I know is okay. I've got is I have a uh, I got one of these uh, Amazon dots. Uh, not you know the 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 round one with the screen. Is that what yeah, it's I called? thought they were hockey pads. No, no, it, it, it's it maybe it's not a dot. What is what do they call the round ones? Spot. I think they're spot. Called. Spot. Yeah, not right. dot. Spot. And uh, uh, it, it's by the bed, and it has the clock, and it also has memos for me that keep recycling and so on. It's very good. It's very nice. In fact, I can even call girlfriend and talk to her and look at my at my spot, uh, spot and uh, there she is. I mean, it's all it's very cool. There's only one problem. She has Alzheimer's. <laughs> and I will be watching TV, and all of a sudden. She says something to me. Well, the circumference is 375 degrees. What? <laughs> you know, or I don't know if I necessarily have an answer to that question. And all I'm doing is watching TV. She's, it's not saying echo, which is the key word that I use. It, it nothing like that. It, she just goes off. And I'm going, shut the fuck up. And then, of course, she turns herself off. Yeah, but I that's mean, what it, that's what it does with my daughter's name is Sarah, and it does it with Siri. Oh, it does it with uh, Siri. You know something? Siri sucks. Siri, yeah, ne yeah, Siri it, it never get gets better. it right. Yeah, and, she, and then she answers wrong too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, but you know, Apple knows that, and they're they're like, okay, you know, this has got to be because everybody else blew them out of the water with it. Well, they so had they a whole to week to bring that shit up this week, and they didn't. Alexa, is, Alexa <laughs> is far more accurate when you say something to it, much more accurate. And uh, Google uh, on my iPad, when I just you know use Google and and uh, say words into it, uh, I even make text. Ray's gonna in meditate. Chrome. What? <laughs> I make Ray somebody. It, yeah, it, I was just looking at his little it, Buddha. It's, it's about ninety-nine percent accurate, but anytime I say something to Siri, it <laughs> never gets it right. Wait a minute. Yeah, what, 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 Ray, what is Ray showing? He, he's Buddha. got his Buddhas there. I think he's got the, the Buddhas. He's going to rub things, rub bellies. I'm going anti-high tech. I was oh. just trying to <laughs> oh, I see, yeah, balance the show. It's great. See, people, you got to watch this show. 
Yeah, because people do a lot of visual humor. And then Scott just sits there. He hasn't said anything all night, have you, Scott? He's on mute. That's why <laughs> you're on. Mute. No, I'm not. I'm just being a. You're, ass. you're being a dick. Yeah. Being a mushroom. Sit in the dark and feed you bullshit. Yeah. He's watching the Warriors. <clears throat> yeah. Vern, I'm going to do a Scott. Uh, what, what's his name? Uh, uh, Brian wanted to call the show tonight because he had some beef with uh, uh, with uh, Amy because Amy supposedly said some nasty things about him. Last night? Not last night. Well, he call said, in, Brian. I don't know what it's all about because I didn't hear it. You know? Yes, okay. Tom. Well, Amy's mad at us because we keep on making toilet humor oh well that's yeah. too bad yeah, still having toto problems yeah uh, still? yeah yeah uh, uh tom yeah and what ray was saying was correct it, it was him and mike and, and of course you know they just you know how mike is he just you know he he likes to blow off steam and and you know mike you mean uh, brian yeah, sacramento oh oh that mike Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Like that doesn't call your show anymore because he's been dis disinvited. Yes, he's been yeah, disinvited. They were, and, uh, and so the two of them were going off with their, you know, their potty mouths, and Amy was not happy. Oh. So Mike, Mike just got pissed Mike off is, because his uh, camera was so bad that Alex was always criticizing how bad his camera looked. Yeah, his camera looked like he had, looked like he had, had sneezed on it at one time and never cleaned it well, he off. Does, he does sneeze all the time. Yeah. yeah. So, and he raises his hand like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, am I... the Warriors. Well, I, I don't want to be mean, but I'm glad to not have him calling this show uh, because that voice drives me crazy. Uh, Scratchy. You know, I agree with you on that. It, it, it's a cancerous-sounding voice. Uh, I'm surprised uh, to make, with a voice like that. I'm, I'm going to die sometime. You, well, you who, uh, who was that guy, Doug, that you kicked off a long time ago? Oh. Doug? He was an alcoholic. Uh, uh, oh. We have a smoker, yeah. alcoholic, and a weed guy. Right? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'd say it was more alcohol was the problem. I he could never I, call in correctly. Well, yeah. you know, I forgave him so many times that I felt like the Pope, you know? I mean, I, 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 I was... So I'm going to spend another 25 minutes trying to figure out where I'm going to plug that thing into. Sorry. It was a change of shape, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, now i got to go run wires. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I thought uh, it was an airport, out. so it was operating on Wi-Fi. It, it does. But I still have to... So do you plug it into the backup battery and then run everything that direction? Or do you plug it, yeah, because I don't want to put it in the surge protector because it's a, a database, so we don't want to do that. All right, thank you. Can you can do it both ways. Why don't you want to put it in a surge protector? Well, because the backup, so I have a huge battery backup because I live places where the wind blows 80 miles an hour sometimes. Well, what happens if you so, suddenly lose power? Big deal. You, you're off the grid. Thank God. Read a book. You know? <laughs> it doesn't help your computer hardware to what go be brought down that way. Well, I, I disagree. I, I've Once had, in a while. Oh, I've, had, I've, I, I've, had my, <laughs> I've had my computers. I've had a, uh, suddenly all the electricity go out and everything goes off. And then I click everything and everything goes back on. I've never, I've never lost any data or anything because of a power failure. Uh huh. No, I'm saying that I, I'll, I'll stand by it because I've been, I got one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, five, uh, six, seven computers in this apartment, and uh, none of them have, have, and all of them have had to crash at one time or another because of an electrical problem or something in the neighborhood or whatever. They go back up in San Francisco in the old days with my old computer. We had an earthquake, and I didn't know till uh, they turned the electricity back on, which was about a week later, whether my computers would work or not, and they started right up. So I wouldn't worry about that, you know. And what if all you right. lose everything? You just start all over again. You start making new friends to put in your phone book, and you start, uh, uh, you know. 
It could be a, a great thing. Yeah, Look at the be. positive sides of things yes, once in a while. Right. No, but I've got to save all this because uh, <laughs> that volcano might erupt and then it'll throw off my metal detectors. And uh, you know what the worst thing that can happen to all that Mac stuff you've got? Hmm. Uh, that what? that, I, that Apple to... will make it passe by saying we're not giving yeah, you the new we the newest. You don't, you uh, don't use the cloud. Huh? I do use the cloud, but I don't use the cloud for all my photos because to put your photos up oh, on yeah. the cloud would just be crazy. Then it's off site. Yeah, I get this. Well, no, I get the amount of money you'd have to pay Apple on monthly on the the four terabyte you use for your photography would be huge. That's why I use Google Drive. It's cheaper. Is it? Yeah. What you, you can get more update? Space. You can upload an unbelievable amount of stuff for like ten bucks a month. Well, you can really. Look, uh, I do. How, yeah. how I much? Got, you, uh, I got uh, ten bucks a month for what? Two terabytes? Yeah, but, but on the Apple, on, on Apple's Apple. program, Apple's cloud. Oh, how, not even near close. How, how, how much do you get for nine ninety nine? Is it like five terabytes See, or something? What, or ten terabytes? What I two, two terabytes for nine nine bucks a month. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when I get to the five terabyte point, and you're, you know, it just. I'm not even close to that, and I got thirty five thousand photos already. And I'm not even close. Yeah. All what I you know is, what if the cloud fucks up? The cloud. You know. You're. Uh, you. Uh, uh, anything boy, anything, anything that I have. All over them. Anything that I have, like videos or things that I cherish, like my porn, I I back up on a second drive. You know. <laughs> Oh, I got that too. Yeah, <laughs> okay. you know, they're making they're making these uh, uh, these. <laughs> I got shit all over the place. They're making these expand <laughs> extended drives uh, uh, cheaper and cheaper. They got I saw eight terabytes today for a hundred and fifty nine bucks. Damn! I just sent all my wow. to Phil's place. It goes to Phil. Yeah, place. I was just he's got, <laughs> he's got forty thousand drive gigs. Yeah, he he, he went. Phil's. And you know how many gigs yep. he's used out of them? One. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> he definitely has professional stuff to it, uh, professional photography to a whole new level, and and I think at his level it's probably all warranted. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> Mark, sorry, but you know, I, so here's a, a, a thought for you, Alex, while you're thinking of new and great things. I see Mark's photos all the time, and we see um, Phil's photos. Is it possible for you to, and I sent you a whale photo, is it possible for you to open a GabNet gallery so that we can post our, our photos instead of posting them on Facebook? Because uh, Mark Thorner shoots some really nice stuff almost every weekend. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Mark, Mark does nice stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so why don't you have a GabNet gallery? Because that would mean that I would have to do work in maintaining the GabNet gallery. <laughs> yeah. So well, sad, well, but you were just complaining that you didn't have anything to do. Well, You're getting rid of our news break, which we like. No, actually, like actually, no. actually, actually I'm bringing it back probably as a four-day-a-week thing starting on Tuesday. But I may <laughs> not, but I may not I do like the, the I may break. not do, What? I like the news break. Yeah, I may not do the video. I, I may not do the video portion or the picture of the day. I may just do the news, and that's it. But yeah, I, haven't, okay. I haven't decided yet. I don't know that you know the the video thing is necessarily that important a part of it. You know, I, I do like the fact that you pimp the show from the night before. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. No, I like. I think that has to be there. Uh, I do. That that takes the I'm most work. Gonna, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. More work for Alex. You don't want to do the Gabnet Gallery. It kind, of, it kind of plugs the show, is what it does. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah, yeah. That's well. I mean, originally, I started the whole thing in order to plug the show. Hey, we have almost. Uh, hey, for a second there, we had almost an all-time high of listening people, and we're not even talking <laughs> about anything. We're not arguing. Phil isn't here. Maybe that's the reason why they're listening. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. You know. Um, yeah, I think you should make a cabinet gallery so that we can throw all of Because you guys know we all take photos, and wouldn't you like to see them instead of going to Facebook to see them? If I had a way that you could just put them up yourself, mm -hmm. uh, I would I would do it. But uh, I have uh, no You don't way like the fact it. that we could send them to you and make you do that? No, I don't want to have to do that. You know, I mean, I got enough stuff. I got to post these shows every day. It's, it, the whole thing's a pain in the fucking ass, you know? <laughs> 
I mean, <laughs> if all I had to do was do a show, life would be wonderful. But that's not all I, I have to do. Probably have to make us administrators of some sort. Put them so on. I'll yeah. I'll pay I'll pay Marjorie for a moment. Well, no, no, wait, 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 wait a minute. You, you have you listen. Uh, you know, I I have to like I post I have to post all these shows. Otherwise, so they go out to our. Uh, they go out to the on demand. They go out to iTunes. They go out to my uh, uh, to the uh, what do you call it site? Uh, the uh, the Roku channels. Uh, and um, by the way, we're getting a lot of viewers to those Roku channels. I looked at the numbers, and a lot of the videos that we're showing are especially off of the Gabnet TV app. There are we have two of them. We have Gabnet and Gabnet TV. And uh, yes, uh, Kevin. Roku question. Yeah. How does that work? You go out and buy a Roku stick just like a right, uh, fire started. stick and everything else that yeah. just plugs in the back of your TV yeah. that works with Roku? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was curious about that. Rob's was really impressive. All the things that could do with that. That no, well, he, well, no, he, he, no, he, liked, he was talking well, he has about a, he has an Amazon one. He had an Amazon fire stick. I have a fire stick, but I, someone told me with uh, this spectrum thing that if I get spectrum I can get a Roku stick and they stream it all through Roku so I was thinking yeah. about doing that yeah. cutting cut my uh, direct TV yes uh, 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 Ray. I, I just did a I just did a fill thing and put a link to my uh, portfolio there in the notes if anyone wants to look at my <laughs> photos Do you have photos Yes, it's in the it's it, it's in the it's in the discussion area. You look at your photos. Yes, you can. Yes. Discussion area. That's wonderful. Yes. See, if we had a Gabnet gallery, this would be a whole lot easier. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, then I do a Gabnet gallery, and there's three. Renee, pictures you there. can maintain it. Well, no, see, he's got a whole bunch of photos that he's trying to decide to do with that was willed to him. I uh -oh. thought a Gabnet gallery would be a good thing. Well, uh, I, I just wish I knew a way of doing it so that all all you had to do was go on there and set it up. All you, I guess you could put the pictures on my Facebook page, but then that would clutter my Facebook page. Yeah, but we're trying to. Why, get off I'll tell you. Why don't you go over to Facebook li our face our uh, uh, Gabnet Live page page on get on Facebook and you can post them there. Oh yeah, man, you was go. your wife doing a pedicure? I'm sorry. What? What? No, I'm she no, she was. Um, What's this about a wife doing a pedicure? I'm looking at Ray's photos. I didn't realize Ray's shot. Who's this blue goddess? Wait a minute. Let me see here. I've seen a lot of Ray's photos on his uh, when he posts. Them. Oh no, there's oh, the see, I have San Francisco it. photos. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Oh, on Instagram. Yeah. See the again. Of San these are just these are just some. I have thousands more. Yeah, I shoot all the time. So Good. where did totally you where, where did, where did you put like the picture? Where did you put the what? picture? I do things like that. Great. Too, yeah. Where did you put the picture? To the the conversation part of Skype. It's funny because uh, I put on the uh, conversation part of Skype, and I don't see any picture there. Yeah. Well, no, you have to click on the link, and it'll the link will send there, you over to it. But there website. is there is no link even. I do that. My uh, you can't see the con the conversation. Yeah, I, put, I showed it's the in the upper right hand. Oh, board. in the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Look, Vernon. Vernon knows tech. <laughs> Vernon's been very quiet tonight. Tap, right, tap us if you tap if you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, th I I meant uh, Morse code, but <laughs> where did you put it? Put it in the chat on the uh, on the YouTube yeah. page. I don't know. No, 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 on Skype. On Skype. No, on Skype. Uh, you can't yeah. put it on YouTube. It doesn't let you put HTML. Yeah, we, so he, he looks at it from a different view. But yeah, we're, this is uh, what talking about. You should still see it. Yeah, well, I can't see it. So. Yeah. Uh, but, I can't can you find post it either. Huh? Oh, there it is. Patrick, what are you doing crossing your eyes like that? I'm <laughs> trying <laughs> to find over on the, uh, 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 the chat part. And it, it's not my uh, mine. It doesn't come up on the chat part. It's the huh. Skype oh, chat. A Skype chat yeah. doesn't come up on Skype chat. Look, folks, wow. uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there. Can you see it? I don't see it. I don't, I don't either. It. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. I don't see that. Huh. Do, 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 do. So I'm the only one that sees this? 
How bizarre. This is an exciting show, but we got more people listening to us than normally do, so, you know, what the hell? Yeah. We're continue with tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the Flutron system little... will allow you to... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there they are, right there. You go to the bottom left corner and hit the little gizmo down yeah. there where yeah. Ray is. And it, no, but I don't, even have, Ray, the I don't even have Ray on there. <laughs> I've got to drag Ray into the, into the screen. Yeah, you got to drag down Ray around. The bottom left corner. Yeah, you got to drag me around. Drag is, around. Uh, there's a little... You know what it might be? Are, 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 are you guys using the newer version of Skype? Yes. Yeah, well, oh, probably. I, because no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I'm using the old classic. Huh. Well, I don't I'm see it. I one. don't see it. I don't just see a bunch of... Now I'm on the new one. I feel left out here. You mm -hmm. have to move around until the, the, the mute sure. buttons and all that stuff come around, and then you move to the left corner, and there's a little dot there with a... Yeah, there's Ray typing now. Oh, yeah. Ray, your puppy shot is very cute. Oh, thanks. See, I can't see it, and I feel left out. It's my you gotta show. got to move around. Move I'll email it to you. Yeah, yeah email oh, it to me. It's a self-portrait of him. Did you just wake up when you did that self-portrait? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Which so one? just quickly, before we go, how many here think our president is doing just a bang-up job at the G7 I do. Summit? I, I do. can't wait till he meets Kim Jong-un. Yeah. I mean, he ought to be fun. Yeah, he's uh, he, he he says he doesn't have to study for this. He doesn't have to prep. <laughs> That's for obvious. It. Uh, I guess all he has to do is read the per the pertinent chapters in the Art of the Deal. You yeah, know. Oh you, you read it on the way over. Yes, on the plane. Tom, and then Patrick. Yeah. And of course, Dennis Rodman's on his way to Sing Singapore, even as we speak. Yeah, he's going to help him. <laughs> and, and this is what I heard on on uh, Marketplace tonight. Yeah. You know who's sponsor? Who's paying for the trip? For Rodman? Yeah. Some. Who? Oh, good. Some sneaker company? No, no. It's it's a uh, it's called a uh, a uh, 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 pot coin. It's it's a it's a it's a it's a. It's a uh, uh, cyber currency for, uh, for 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 pot growth, you know, for for people. Oh, that oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? And, oh, oh, yeah. Weed, weed money. <laughs> and, is, and is he actually going to help Trump while he's over there? Well, translate. Yeah. Can't do any worse. I'm gonna get him a tattoo <laughs> I, too. Yeah. Uh, uh, let me. Uh, Patrick's got his hand up. I I had heard about Rock as well, and frankly, I think it's a good idea because. Kim thinks that Rodman is God anyway, and if, you know, and I know everybody got their doubts about this, and even Trump has said, we'll see what happens. If Rodman being there helped propel this in a peaceful uh, progression, mm -hmm. then I guess I'll eat my own word that I've made fun of Rodman going over there the last couple of years. We, we, and we, frankly, the yeah. other thing is, I don't know exactly what it is that everybody expects Trump to study to go over, <laughs> you know, seriously, to go over to North Korea where no one gone over there and done anything really in 70 years. What oh, it oh, oh, no, 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 believe it or not, there have been people over there in short time. Diplomacy. He needs to study diplomacy. Bill Clinton went over there. Yeah. It's like having a baby. They don't have a manual. He needs to learn how to wear no, his No, it's... His... <laughs> <laughs> Warriors. <laughs> no, he, he's... Yeah, uh, uh, I want him wait, to be wait. tapped out. Ver Vernon Nunn has said nothing tonight. Let him say something. Vernon? Okay. I found something on YouTube the other night that was interesting. There's a young man who does a show called David Pacman. And he's he's very left leaning, and he did a, a skit talking about Trump and his low literacy rate, and he went through and did a textbook definition of what what literacy, or how you can tell if somebody has very low literacy, and Trump fits every one of them to a T. He has this military thing when they canceled the Eagles, and he didn't even know the words to America the Beautiful. Wow. Right, yeah. It was sad. Wow. I don't think he knows the, the words to the Star Spangled Banner because if he got a lip no. re if he got a lip reader to watch him try to sing it, 
I think he's getting it wrong. But that's for another day. Hey, we've run out of time here. Thank you so much to Mark for being here. Always good seeing you, Mark. Uh, thank you to Patrick. Thank you to Jeff. Jeff, I don't think you've said a word tonight. I was pretty quiet today. Yeah. Uh, but you can tell me next week. Wait a minute. Uh, hold on that way. If you else. keep going, that'll be two words more than Scott has said tonight. Kevin, thank you so much. Renee, thank you. Tom, always a pleasure. Ray, always a pleasure. Scott, we love you. And Vernon. Did you read his lips? Thank you. Did you read his lips, Alex? No. What were his lips saying? Oh, there we go. Yes. Fine you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Everybody, give uh, give a big wave goodbye to our uh, our crowd so that they can see you in your all your wonderful glory okay good night everybody yeah there they go and that's the citizen panel for tonight let me hang up on them here so the next show can use the uh the facilities uh i'm going to turn myself off here and now the lines are open for the next show which happens to be connect uh, happens to be connection happens to be uh, a wonderful show uh, called Intersection with Jack and Amy, and that will be followed at uh, one. Uh, at, um, <laughs> excuse me, one o'clock in the morning, Eastern Daylight Time with Connections. We'll see you again Tuesday, right after Damian Chaplin in the Exchange at nine thirty at ten o'clock, same time, same station in life. In the meantime, and as always, if you see her. Tell her I love her, okay? Bye. <laughs>